Good morning, everybody. What's up? How are we doing? Yeah? How are we doing with uh, watching the Olympics? Anyone watching the Olympics? Show me the hands. Yeah? Oh, good, 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 good. I am just amazed. I, I watch Olympians, and I go like, that's why they're Olympians. They're just like really, really good at the very thing they do. And I'm actually really, really just proud and stoked for Simone. Uh, I mean, what a cool storyline, right? Like, it's great. Struggles a little bit, comes back, redemption story, and is just doing awesome. I feel like one of her, her, the things that's going to happen with her is she will be like, uh, the, we use the word goat, right? The greatest of all time kind of thing. And she'll just be Simone. Like, because the great ones all get like one name, right? Like, I'm going to show my age right here in two seconds. Uh, like, Cher. Right? Does anybody know her last name? No, we haven't know her last name. She's just Cher, right? Kind of thing. Uh, or like Bono. You know, it's not even his real name, but we just know him, he's Bono, you know, kind of thing. Uh, there's a lot of other ones that are out there. Uh, I would say someone like, oh, well, I'm a soccer person, so I like Pele. Yeah, nobody knows who, what his, first, his last name was. Is that his first name? Is that his last name? What is it, right? He's just the greatest of all time. And actually, this is a, a lead into our message today. I, I actually think that names matter. Like, there's something about names that kind of shape us, form us, and kind of represent us in so many different ways. I've traveled around the world, and so many different cultures have different ways to use names. Like, how do names show up in their life? And so, like, there's certain cultures that the name is a derivative of, like, the lineage, like the father's line or the mother's line. And the name is a derivative of that. So you're like, oh, I know who you're related to because of your name. There's other cultures that like the name becomes symbolic or it's, it's kind of representative of maybe who they want their child to be or who they think that they are, that kind of thing. I have a friend in Eastern Europe. Her name is Luba. It means love in the language that she's grown up in. So her name is love. We've named people like things like charity. Uh, like a common name in kind of the sports world in different cultures is the name Tiger. You know, we got a good golfer named Tiger Woods, right? Uh, they use that name. I have a, we have a student at Bushdale University where I serve uh, on the baseball team. His middle name is Danger. Like he literally gets to walk up in any conversation and go, you know, my middle name is Danger. I think it's just awesome. Uh, we had a student from Kenya. Her name is Purity. I mean, names matter. They shape us. They say something about who we are. Um, our three young men uh, now, their middle name, their first name is just kind of a, a name we liked. And if, you, if I told them to, you'd go like, oh, they were born in the 90s. Okay. <laughs> Straight up, they were. Uh, and then the, their middle name is a, is a biblical character, a reference to a biblical character. So hoping that they maybe lean into the good parts of that person's story. Um, my, uh, my younger brother, his middle name is Neil. Uh, my dad worked in the aerospace world, and so guess who he's named after? Yeah, Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon. Uh, and then uh, my wife is here. My wife, Dawn, there she at. She's There she is. Uh, her name is Dawn. Of course, it means sunrise. If you know anything about her, she definitely has a sunny personality. Um, my first name is Troy, and there's a little bit of a debate on this. I, I think I know what the answer is. But my dad says it's after the men of Troy, another former Pac-12 team down in Southern California. I know I'm in the wrong place to say the name. We will not say the name. Uh, but that's where we grew up, and so, and my uncle went there, big fans, and so Troy is supposed to be there. I think my mom really liked Troy Donahue, the actor. Anyone? Like, this is, again, another age thing, you know, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and uh, my middle name is after two grandfathers and an uncle, and it's all connected to, like, our Slovak heritage, uh, John or Johan. Um, but I recently discovered, actually, what my, my name really does actually mean. So Troy, recently I found out that it actually means one who can only be portrayed by Brad Pitt. <laughs> so I got that going for me, you know. That's the only choice they had. Uh, no, I think that so names often represent hope from our families, they, they, what we hope will happen in our children. We're actually going to talk about two names, one specific, but two brothers in this message today. We've been in Genesis, and we've been talking about different characters in their story. And in their story arc, where is God? What is he showing up? How is he teaching us something through their life? And so we're going to talk primarily about Jacob today. Uh, but, but Jacob and Esau are both names that mean something. And they're kind of living a legacy as their, as their story unfolds. 
Like their name actually kind of does represent. And in the long term, even Esau's name shows up in some very unique ways in Scripture. Like he's a, a whole lineage of people. But I, I think what we ultimately know, and I think we ultimately are honest about it in our quiet moments, is that we're all chasing something. We're all chasing something. Whether it's a name that we have we're trying to achieve or things in this world that we feel like we need to grasp or get, we're looking for dignity. We're looking for honor. We're looking for success. We're looking for value. We're looking for all these kind of things. And we're all chasing something. And that's really kind of the beginning of the story of Jacob and Esau. See, we uh, talked last week, Pastor Steve talked about um, Isaac. Isaac marries Rebecca, and Rebecca is pregnant with two children. Now, they're twins, fraternal twins. And in the moment that this story begins, we find this in Genesis 25. And oh, and by the way, I'm going to throw a lot of scriptures on the wall. Matter of fact, Bethany is going to do that for us today. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to tell you the story as one story. So I'd rather you just kind of sit in the story. Everybody say, sit in the story. So it's there as a reference. I'm not cheating. I'm not making stuff up. I might throw in some Troyisms, but that's about it, okay? If you've heard me teach before. So here it begins, Genesis 25. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? This is Rebecca, right? This is mom. So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. That's how you show up. You're like, hairy baby. So they named him Esau. Esau means red. After this, after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Jacob gets translated most of the time as deceiver. I think it could be clever and manipulator as well. He's holding on to the heel. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac had a taste for wild game, while Esau uh, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So Esau, outdoorsy, Jacob, indoorsy, right? We have those two kind of kids nowadays, right, don't we? Like we're watching that happen in our own world today, right? The, the outdoorsies and the indoorsies, right? I thought, I don't know if the, the author is like playing some game, but he liked to stay among the tents. <laughs> More of a glamper, you know? Not going not gonna to really rough it in the tent outside. He's going to have the, you know, pull the fifth wheel. Uh, but you see the stage is set, right? It's setting us up for there's a rivalry going on and there's favoritism. And I don't know if there's any kind of things that are just like easy to access in our world today than those two things. We can see rivalries. We see favoritism. And in, honestly, I love how honest the scripture is with us. Because at the end of the day, it's naming the stuff that we all go through. It's still the same today. We struggle with the ways that which generations we receive things, what happens in our families and our family systems, and how we show up with each other, how names get put on us, all those different kind of things. And we're chasing after the things in this world that bring value to us. We're chasing influence and wealth, power. We're looking for deeper meaning and purpose in life. We're looking for love, attention, peace. And I think ultimately, with our names and the ways that we're chasing after things, I think we're actually more driven than we are called. I, if we're called to something, you know, if there's a voice that calls us, we're, we're being beckoned towards something, we're hearing the voice and we're moving toward it. We're, we're kind of voluntarily leading into it. We want to follow, we want to serve, we want to connect, we want to hear that voice and go toward it. But so much of what we're experiencing today oftentimes is voices inside of us pushing us, that chasing after thing. Like, I feel driven by something. I'm not following something, I'm being driven toward it. And that changes us, that shapes us, that forms us. I'm driven by what I want and who I think I'm supposed to be. And those two things are going to come out in the story of Jacob. I love uh, one of the, the series of movies, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. And it's always interesting to me that when you create a character that becomes so iconic, Jack Sparrow, you know, kind of moment, this 
pirate. And the funny thing about his story is that he doesn't even know who he is or what he wants. Matter of fact, a part of the story, they actually write in a compass that becomes like his conscience, you know, kind of like Jiminy Cricket, you know. Like he has to look at it and go, oh, that's where I want to go? Okay. And I think sometimes the same thing's happening to us. We really don't know what we want. We think we know what we want, but they chase after it. It doesn't really help. We know who we are, but we're like, but that's not who I really am. I'm doing things I don't think are really who I'm supposed to be. And so this story kind of launches us into this epic kind of narrative of, of Jacob's life in a moment, a moment of thievery. See, Jacob really, really, really wants what Esau is giving. As the eldest firstborn son, he would be giving two things from his family, from his lineage, his generation, from his father. The first one is a birthright. And his birthright, he would get approximately, depending on how you understand the culture of the time, two-thirds of the inheritance, and then the one-third would be left to Jacob and others. So he gets, as the firstborn, the birthright. And he comes with all kinds of uh, wealth and, and success. The second thing he would get is the blessing. Now, the blessing is, is kind of what you think it is, but in our culture, we don't really necessarily have this. In the culture of the time, the blessing would be the patriarch of the family would speak words of affirmation and uh, of, of future promise to the eldest, to the firstborn son. Like it was, it was filled with emotion, dignity, honor, value. Like that would be like a, a rite of passage that was above every other rite of passage there was to get the blessing from your parent. Now, Jacob came out holding Esau's heel, right? I almost feel like in some ways to say he's like, I'll go first, right? Like he's trying to pull him back so he gets out first because the whole part of his story is about him chasing after these things. And he figures out a way to actually get both from Esau. To continue in the story, Esau has just been out hunting or whatever he's been doing. Uh, he comes in and he's famished. And I can imagine like the way that Esau shows up. It's kind of like sometimes like how some of our kids show up. He walks in and goes, I'm starving. I'm so hungry. And I'm like, as a parent, yeah, there's other people in the world who actually are starving. Stop it. And go get some food. You know what I mean? I kind of think that moment. But Esau is like, he's like a little bit extra, right? He's like, he's, he's kind of a little bit of a drama guy right now. He's like, I'm so starving. And Jacob's like, well, promise me your birthright. I'll get you some food. He goes, what good's my birthright? It's such short-term thinking, right? <laughs> well, I just, I just need food right now, right? He's hangry, right, at the same time. He's like, well, yeah, fine, whatever my birthright. So we pick it up in Genesis 25. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau says. All right, dude. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, well, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. Really? You might want to upgrade the meal if you're selling your birthright, buddy. He ate and drank and got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. He didn't even value the very powerful thing that he was granted as a firstborn. Well, it didn't stop there because there's another moment, the moment of the blessing. And in this part of the story, Isaac is getting old. His vision is not really good. He's actually getting to the point where he's like, I don't know when I'm going to die. So I need to bless my firstborn son, Esau. So Isaac invites Esau into the room. He says, hey, here's the deal. I want you to go out, hunt, Get that great food that you do so good. Bring it in. Prepare a meal for me. And I will give you my blessing. The promises. The honor. This, this moment where the rest of the community goes, oh, that is the son who will take over for Isaac. Well, here's the deal, though. Rebecca's listening in. She's like around the corner listening in. And she's like, uh-uh. We're going to pull this off. So she goes and gets Jacob and says, here's the deal. Your father, Isaac, wants to give the blessing to Esau, but I want him to give him to you. So we're going to get you to go in there because his eyesight's not so good. And you're going to tell him that you're Esau. And Jacob's like, mom, it's not going to work. I mean, he's going to tell by my voice. 
I don't smell like Esau. <laughs> Smells like someone who's been in a, in a deer pitch, right? Uh, <laughs> like he's been hunting, right? And the dude's hairy. Mom's got ideas. Just rolls around the dirt a little bit. I don't know. And he gets them smelling like, uh, like Esau. And then they start putting like goat skins, goat hair skins on his arms. I'm like, Esau's got some coarse hair if that's going to work. You know what I mean? But he does. He goes in. And Isaac thinks a little bit something's up because he goes, hey, how'd you do that so fast? And he's got an answer. Jacob is a deceiver. He's a manipulator. He's got good words. He goes, ah, God gave me success. He granted me grace. And he's like, well, it sounds like Jacob. And he goes, no, 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 Father, like, get closer. Feel my arms, that kind of thing. And then Isaac ultimately goes, sounds like Jacob, smells like Esau. I don't necessarily know that that's what you want in your life uh, to be. <laughs> that's not a goal. Uh, to sound like Jacob, smell like Esau. But it works. Isaac gives his blessing, not to Esau, the firstborn, but to Jacob. All the promises, all the vision of what can happen, the dignity, the, the blessing that so deeply forms and shapes each one of us, the, the what we're looking for so much in this life. Immediately, almost afterward, Esau comes in. He's already done it. The, uh, he's, he's hunted. He's made the meal. And he brings it in. And his dad is like, what do you mean? I just gave my blessing to you. And it dawns on both of them the fact that Isaac's been deceived. Jacob has stolen the blessing. And when you read this passage, I encourage you this week to go back, read the passage, read this whole storyline. You could feel like it, the anguish, the, the, the loss, the pain in Esau's voice. Listen to these words out of uh, Genesis 27. Who are you? I'm your son, Esau says. Your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came in, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said, Father, bless me. Me too, Father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Isn't he rightly named Jacob? Now it becomes revealed, right? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? I don't know about you, but I can identify with a sense of pain or loss at chasing after some form of blessing in this world and not getting it. Matter of fact, my own story with my own father has some kind of, kind of pieces of this. I mean, I think so much of what I did early in my life, and this is kind of like, you know, you kind of learn later on, was chasing after some form of blessing. Something to try to get my dad to say words of like affirmation or encouragement to me. To say like, son, I'm proud of you. There's so much in our life that we're chasing after some kind of blessing. And for me, it was my dad. My dad was an engineer. He was a Marine. Didn't have a lot of words. I know he had gone through a lot of things in his life. And he wasn't a very verbal person. I mean, I would remember playing sports and looking up in the stands. Did, can I get the, the approval? Like, hey, way to go, attaboy kind of thing. And for me, in my life, those words never came verbally to me. Looking up in the stands, watching and see if he would say those words. See, Jacob lives by his given name. He lives by his given name. It's the name that was given to him. See, he didn't, earned that name, but it gave, it was given to him. And ultimately we see the pattern of life that he lives out of the name given to him by others. And don't we all do that on some level? We live out of the names that others have named us with. We live out of the words that have been projected toward us or the things we've been called. And so much of our life is trying to figure out who am I based on these names and these words that I've been called and the ones I've been given. And sorting that out is probably the culmination of adulthood. He's named the deceiver. He manipulates. He controls. And in his life, you see a pattern all the time. He controls, manipulates, deceives, gets freaked out. He's terrified. He's fearful that something's going to happen, and he runs. He escapes, avoids, 
doesn't ever confront, doesn't ever reconcile. And that's what happens. Immediately following this, Rebecca's like, well, hey, your brother is, is going to, he's mad, he's angry, he's going to get after you. Matter of fact, he can hit you from distance even, you know what I mean? Like, you need to get out of here. So she connives the story and tells Isaac she's not happy with the potential suitors that Jacob could have as a wife. And so she's going to send him off to a, a, a far off land where there's other relatives or people that are like him. And so he, she does that, sends him off to a, a distant uncle named Laban. And that's where we find Jacob next. He's run away from his home, and he's out where Laban is. And Laban has two daughters. I love how stories are told. The older is named Leah, and the younger is Rachel. And it's interesting, because in the story, how Jacob meets Rachel is that he's actually at a well, and Rachel is bringing a bunch of goats and animals and livestock to get watered, and that's how he meets her, and then finds out that she's connected to his uncle. I'm like, Rachel's kind of like Esau. <laughs> Awkward moment where like, who are you? What do you want in this life? And he falls in love with Rachel. And so he goes back and tells Laban, like, I want to marry Rachel. Laban's like, okay, seven years. Work for me for seven years, and after that seven years, you can marry Rachel. It's really actually very sweet. In the story, the scripture says that it seemed like a few days to Jacob. Everybody say, oh, isn't that sweet? Like it's seven years, and he's like, no, it's just like, it's a couple days, right? So the day comes, throws a big party. I mean, the weddings that they throw were like weeks long, right? But there's like this culmination. We all know what happens on the night of the eve of the, of the wedding. And that happens. And the scripture reveals that the next morning after that, when morning came, Genesis 29, there was Leah. What, 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 wait, hold on. Who's lying next to Jacob in the bed? Leah. Uh-oh, the oldest one. Now, again, I don't know. How did this happen? Is that just a really thick veil? I don't know. I mean, like, there's a lot of imbibing that's happening at this wedding, I think. Uh, there's a little bit of all that that's probably true. And at the end of the day, Laban deceives Jacob. Jacob says, so what have you done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Well, he says, well, seven years. It's, it's dishonorable for the oldest daughter to not be married off first. So we had to do this, right? Right, sure. And so he works for another, another seven years and he marries Rachel. Now, the whole storyline here is that the amount of, of years that Jacob actually works for Laban is closer to 20, 20 years. And again, this is Jacob. So what does Jacob do? J Jacob is chasing after stuff. He feels like he needs things. He's already got a birthright. He's got a blessing, but he needs more. So he begins to sort and sift the livestock of Laban. He holds for himself the stronger of the livestock and gives, in a, you know, in the, the, he separates the herds and the weaker ones are Laban's. He's been doing this for years. It's clever how he does it. It's interesting. You might want to read it. It's fun. Genesis 31. Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it has been. You think? <laughs> Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all he had, crossed the Euphrates River, and headed for a hill country of Gilead. So he knows that, again, he's been deceiving, he's been manipulating, he's afraid he's going to get caught, he's in trouble, he's not that strong. So what does he do? He runs away. And let's just be honest. When we feel those same things, we're worried about certain things, we're feeling fear, terror, we're unsure what's going on, we will run away too. It might be that we actually do what they did, actually move somewhere else, or it might be we, we just disappear. We avoid, we go quiet, we go solitary, but we run. Now, it's interesting. In the story, it says that uh, Jacob has a three-day start. So Laban doesn't even know he's gone for three days. And you're like, he's going to get away. He's totally going to get away. But he's, he's an indoorsy guy, right? He's got a lot of livestock. It takes him only seven days to catch him. And then Laban confronts him. Everything you have is from me. What are you doing? Why are you hiding? 
Why are you running away? And Jacob basically confessed to Jesus, I, I was terrified. I thought you'd take back your daughters. I thought you'd take back all the stuff I have. And I was terrified, so I ran. They come to a little bit of an agreement. I'm not sure I like the way that it happens. Uh, I think Jacob is just manipulating again. I think he's just trying to figure out a way to get out of the situation. Laban starts heading back toward home. And now what does Jacob have in front of him? To go back home. But who's at home? Esau. He's got 20 years of like, when I lay my hands on that guy, if I see him again, right? There's 20 years of bitterness, resentfulness, anger, hurt, loss, all those things. So Jacob's like, okay, I Esau is going to be that way. So I'm going to send some messengers. He sends some messengers, loads them up with a whole bunch of like livestock and gifts. He's going to try to bribe his way back in, right? Again, this is Jacob, right? Bribe his way back into the situation. And they all go, the servants come back and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah we met with Esau. Uh, he received the gifts. Uh, he's coming. Uh, oh, and he's bringing 400 men with him. Right? Now, Jacob is... To use a cliche, right? He's stuck between a Laban and an Esau. What's he going to do? He being terrified before, it's more so. Now here's the thing. I think this is actually the lowest point of Jacob's life. Because what he decides to do next is dark. Genesis 32. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. That's who I'll go with. Ouch, right? Sends Leah one way, sends Rachel the other way, divides up the socks, sits on a hill, waits and sees. Which one gets attacked? I'll escape with the other one. The good news is, God's not going to let that happen. God actually has a bigger plan. God shows up in this story in a profound way. And I think it's a great story and a picture for each one of us as well. I call it the wrestling match. Jacob is by himself, waiting for this kind of moment of decision. And the scripture says that a man comes and begins to wrestle with him. Now, the story evolves over the couple chapters. It, he also names him as an angel of the Lord. And then at the end of the story, Jacob acknowledges it's God who he wrestled with. In this wrestling match, it's interesting because it's, it seems like Jacob's getting the upper hand. But again, we know he's what? Indoorsy, right? Yeah. He's not going to win the wrestling match. I feel like it's a little bit like, because if it's with God, right? He's not beating God. I think it's like me and my kids when they were really younger. I'm like, oh, oh, you pinned me. You got me. You know, okay, no moment. But just for Jacob to know that he's wrestled with God, it says that this stranger or angel or God touches his hip and wrenches it out of socket, dislocates his hip. Incredible pain. Jacob is now not able to win. But Jacob won't let go of it. And Jacob even asks him for his name. And this person he's wrestling with you know, doesn't give him his name. There's a cool aha moment that happens a little bit later in the story. But he doesn't give his name. But instead, he gets a new name, Jacob. He says, from now on, you will be called Israel. Now, we know that's a historic name, right? It's a nation. There's a country right now. The Israelites are all that we talk about through the rest of the New Testament, or Old Testament, is the Israelites, right? Like this is a moment of definition for Jacob's life. It's profound. But I want you to notice something in the story. He has already gotten, right? He's already received both a birthright and a blessing, and he's still not satisfied. He's not at peace. He, he's not living into those two gifts because he knows they're ill-conceived. They're, they're ill-gotten. He manipulated his way into the getting those. And so I think this is a profound moment for each one of us as well. Brokenness precedes the blessing. 
See, we have to show up in a place of humility. We need to show up in a place knowing that we are not able to achieve these things. We can only be gifted them out of the grace and love of the other. Brokenness is a prerequisite to the blessing. So here's the big idea for our story today. The big idea is this. We won't know what we really want or who we really are until we wrestle with God. In my own story, uh, I, didn't know what, I didn't know how to resolve this sense of not receiving a sense of verbal blessing from my father. And I, I, I felt like there was something in me that said, I should say something, but I didn't, want, I didn't want to feel shame. I didn't want to feel malicious. I didn't want to do it out of spite. I wasn't trying to like guilt my dad into doing something he shouldn't do. But I felt like I should do something to say, hey, dad, I just want you to know, I love you. And I was always the one that initiated love with my dad on the phone. Hey, love you, pop. And then he'd respond, love you too, son. Like that was the kind of the, the pattern that we had. I was at, totally at peace about that. I know my dad had not received the blessing that probably from his parents that, that I was kind of asking for or looking for from him. So I don't, I don't blame him for that at all. That's his storyline. But I wrote a letter. I just wrote a letter and said, hey, dad, just want you to know, you don't ever have to say this. I'm not looking for you to say something. I'm not looking for you to do anything. So you know, I would just been, I think I would have liked a little bit more like attaboys, a little bit more like, hey, I'm proud of you kind of moments. Worked really hard. And I think I, I wanted that from you. But I just want you to know, it's no blame. There's no shame, that kind of thing. I was probably way more eloquent at the time. We won't know what we really want until we wrestle with God. I think partly is because we need some kind of revelation. We need some kind of insight that is only available to us by God, right? In that moment of wrestling, Jacob is wrestling with, again, he doesn't understand the situation. But at some point in the story, he realizes he's not able to pull it off on his own. I think that moment is a moment of confession for us, for our sin, for our waywardness, for the ways in which we we don't show up the way we think we should. It, it, it's, it's a brokenness that knows that, man, we have limits to who we are. We struggle with certain things. There's certain parts of our own story that have addictions and, and different ways in which we have thoughts and they direct us and all those kind of things. Like it's, it's, it's just being honest about being human beings in need of God. The other part of this is that we won't know who we are until God names us. I, I'm thankful for that moment because Jacob, so much of his story is, is driven by his name, right? He's a deceiver. But now he gets a new name, Israel. It's about God being present in his life. It's a different story, different name. And until we, in our own lives, receive the names that God says about us, who he is, we will constantly be using the names that are sent to us, that we hold on to, that have shaped us. The next birthday I had, my uh, dad sent a card. And my, my dad, I, I, I really believe this, he said the words that he said through Hallmark. I can imagine him sitting in a row of like Hallmark cards. Like, no, yeah, no, no. But it, whenever I got a card from him, it was, it was literally the stuff I'm like, oh, that's what you wanted to say. <laughs> but Hallmark did it for you. That's good. And I loved it. He always signed his cards to us, my brother and I, in a red pen, love, pop. That was it. That was the extent. Not, I told you, not a lot of words, right? The next birthday, I get a card from my dad, and I'm like, oh, this is a good one. You know, Hallmark did a good job. I appreciate it. I see you, Dad. Good job. I'm proud of you. Love, Pop. Now, some of you are like, dude, that's a low bar. <laughs> but that's not the important part. There was a way for him to respond in what he saw and understood, but didn't also feel weird or awkward or shame. So he got to say what he wanted to say, a few words. I, I'm proud of you, love Pop. There was a couple weeks later where I'm on the phone with my dad, and again, I told you how that phone call always ends. Love you, Pop. Love you too, son. Hang up. I'm sitting in the room, and, and my wife will tell you this because it was a moment that we will never forget, but I'm sitting there, and I find myself saying, love you too, Dad. 
he beat me to the punch. Like he actually initiated it before I did. Now, I want you to hear in all of this, there is, there is nothing, nothing in this world that will ever take the place of God naming you. But I do think that we each bear a responsibility and a stewardship of God's love for one another. If you have the chance to say words of affection, affirmation, approval, encouragement, please use those even if you're a person of few words. We all need this. This is what we're chasing. This is what we're being driven by. At the end of the day, we need to hear those words from God. I figured out at some point in my, my journey with God that my heavenly father was the one that was going to offer all of that. I was going to receive primarily from him words of affection, affirmation, who I am, dignity, value, the amago day, the image of God is in each one of us, granted at the time we were created, right? And so this entire series, what we've been walking through, is all this character traits of God. Every story we've heard through Genesis, every person we've investigated, what you're hearing in their story is something about the character of God. Can I get an amen? Like God is revealing himself in these stories. So names of God, like Elohim, right? In the beginning, God created, right? Elohim, he's the creator God. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Adonai, the God who is almighty, who is worthy to be served. El Shaddai, the almighty, pray to for the impossible because he is faithful. Jehovah Jireh, the, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. As a matter of fact, Paul says, may the God of peace and the peace of God be with you. The rock, God is my rock in Psalms that's often written, right? He is our strength. He is our stability. Yahweh the unspoken name of God that Moses receives at the burning bush, the I am, the God who has always been and will always be and is just I am. And then later on, there's a really cool part of the story. Next week, we're going to talk about Joseph. And the words of Jacob to Joseph reveals another name of God that Jacob has now understood, and he calls him my shepherd. You see, our real identity is only found in Christ's name. Now, how I'm using this today is that how Christ names us, what Christ says about us, what Scripture reveals that is already true. You cannot earn it. When Jesus receives the, the proud moment, the, the blessing from his heavenly Father at his baptism, what has Jesus accomplished by that point? Nothing. It's a gift. It's by grace. And so the names that Jesus gives to us. The scripture says, our last few minutes, I'm just going to ask you to just take a moment. Deep holy breath, present here. I'm going to read to you a list that some of you might be very familiar with, but it's what scripture says about you. It is true, but you have to receive it. You are a new creation. You are complete in him. You are God's masterpiece. You are a child of God. You are righteous. You are dearly loved. You're forgiven of all your sins. You are accepted in him. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. You're blessed, chosen, called, more than a conqueror. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have been sanctified. You're being changed into the image of God. You are set free, healed by his wounds, free from condemnation. You're a citizen of heaven. You're free from the law of sin and death. You're an ambassador for Christ. You're reconciled to God. You're under grace, dead to sin, alive with Christ, a slave to righteousness. You are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. You are light of the world. You are salt of the earth. You are the one with Christ. You are strong in the Lord. You are strengthened with all power. You can do all things. You are victorious. Can I get an amen? amen. You are enriched in every way. You are not alone. You are owned by God. You are zealous for his works. You are priests and kings. You are sealed by the Spirit. You are under God's training and loving discipline. You're his possession. You've been bought with a high price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That is a list of who you are. It doesn't even include what you have in Christ. See, that moment of wrestling changes Jacob. 
Most commentaries, and as you kind of study through all these different chapters of his story, you find that Jacob refers to God in his prayers as the God of my fathers and the fear of Isaac. But that was an interesting thing to throw in there. It could be respect. That's usually what fear means in the Old Testament. But I'm also thinking with Jacob, it might have a little bit of a deeper meaning. You know what I mean? The God of my fathers, the fear of Isaac. It changes. Later on, we begin to see a new pattern emerge. When Jacob prayers, he says, my Lord and my God. He has had a personal encounter with God. He's got a great history, a great lineage. But now it became personal. I'm asking that today that you would receive the blessing of all those words. That you would receive knowing who God is, his character, what he has for you. I'm asking that you would receive the blessing of those words, what, who you are in Christ's name. But you're going to have to receive it. Find that place of humility, of brokenness. And know that you are deeply loved more than you can ever imagine. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for these moments in the scripture. Thank you for the story of Jacob and how it reveals to us how much we need to stop chasing and being driven. But God, how we need to receive from you your blessing. May the words that you say be the most true things that we believe in the deepest places of our heart and mind. That we are accepted and loved that you are actually proud of us, that God, you actually like us, and that, Father, you have forgiven us and given us a new way forward. We are new creations with new names. Thank you, God, that we receive that in this time of reflection today. In Christ's name, amen. Here, there are three ways that we continue in worship, but we also give you the opportunity to do something to respond. One of those is, is offering. Churches do offerings, and you can put some money in the bucket as it goes by. If you're visiting at this place, we invite you to not worry about that. And then also, there's ways you can give online. But it's, a, it's in a proper way. It's a proper way to respond to God's love. Not to try to earn it, but just to say thank you. There are some words in the songs we're going to sing. They're intentional. The songs are chosen because they remind us of truths about who God is. And I hope that you sing along. And then lastly, in the corners, there is communion. The Lord's table. There's two elements, a little cracker and a little cup of juice. They remind us that Jesus went on the cross. His body took pain on it. That was really intended for us. And he bled on that cross. And his blood represents the forgiveness that is now available to each one of us. I hope you know who you are in Christ's name.